Okay, well, it's one o'clock, so I'd like to welcome everybody to the FSHD University. Uh, this is your place for learning about the art and science of living with FSHD, the research that's going on toward improving quality of life and health and developing treatments for this community. Uh, before we get in, I wanted to remind the audience if, the, if they're currently in the Fortitude trial, please do not disclose this information because we don't want the full, the, I'm sorry, the Avidity team to, um, to know your identity because it's a blinded study. So please just uh, be mindful of that. Uh, and, um, and also I wanted to just mention that um, publicly traded companies are highly regulated in the drug development space. So there may be questions that they are just not um, allowed to, you know, information they're not allowed to disclose in a public setting like this. So we just want everybody to, ha you know, to have that understanding. So, uh, so welcome today. Uh, and kicking off our webinar is Sarah Boyce, who is president and CEO of Avidity Biosciences. Sarah has more than 25 years of global leadership experience in both pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical companies, including uh, Axia Therapeutics, Ionis, Forest Laboratories, Alexion, Novartis on Oncology, and Roche. And Sarah's tenure at Avidity has been marked by transformative leadership, starting with the company's successful Series C funding round and IPO. And Sarah was named a Healthcare Technology Report Top 25 Biotech CEO in 2022. And I love this one. She's been named one of the fiercest women in life sciences. Sarah, we're honored to have you with us today. And the mic is yours. Thank you so much. And um, the first, one of the fiercest women is also one of my favorites. <laughs> um, anyway, so in terms of thank you so much for inviting us um, to join you today and be part of the FSHD University. Um, during the course, if we could go back just one slide, please. During the course of this presentation, um, we will be making forward-looking statements. We are a publicly traded company. So as was described, we are heavily regulated. And in terms of what I would ask is that people, we have our full, full forward-looking statement on our website. But essentially, this is about um, that we will be making educated guesses based on what we know, but they are not essentially sure things. And also that, um, you know, these statements in the presentation, they're not promises. Um, and what actually happens might be different because a lot of unexpected, unexpected um, changes can come up. And if we go to the next slide, please. It's a delight to be um, actually uh, joining you today on World FSHD Day. I'm here in my orange as part of that. And these are just some of the photos of the Avidity team. Um, some of my colleagues are here today, but not everyone. And at its simplest form, we are just a group of people trying to bring great science and develop drugs to help other people. And these are just some of our team members. And if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, from an aspect of, it's always really important for me to make sure that we acknowledge and thank all the contributions that paved the way for the Fortitude trial. And they're both in terms of the FSHD clinical trial network, the natural history studies, patient advocacy organizations, obviously the FSHD society playing a, pure, a huge role, and the whole community um, around FSHD, both families, patients, and caregivers. Um, I would also like to acknowledge and thank all the participants in the Fortitude study for the time that they give to the study, to the investigators in the study, and all the um, team members at the site for all of their hard work and continued commitment um, to the Fortitude study. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So in terms of, and then the next slide, because I already... Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please, slide six. 
So in terms of one of the aspects in drug development, initially a drug will have a code name. Um, so in this case, formerly known as AOC 1020. AOC stands for antibody oligonucleotides. That's the type of drug that this is. Um, then you get a generic name. In our case, the generic name is rather long. It's Dalpasabard, Braxloseran. So we've shortened it to Dalbrax. So you will hear Dalbrax used throughout this presentation. And it's still the same drug as AOC 1020. It just has what's called a generic name. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So what we're going to share, to you to, share with you today is some of the initial data from the Fortitude study that we shared last week, as well as an update on the next phase of development for Dalbrax, how partnership with the community, patients, advocates has been so meaningful in getting us to where we are today, as well as also um, the important contributions of study participants to improve care, for, not just for everyone, and to advance potential treatments for FSHD. I hope that we can also convey to you the sense of deep urgency that we feel at Avidity, as well as the responsibility that we have um, to the FSHD community and our commitment to do our very, very best work with the goal of ultimately being able to improve lives of people who are impacted by FSHD. And if we can go to the next slide, please, from an aspect of for today's agenda, um, Amy Halseth, who is our Executive Director of Clinical Development, she will talk about directly targeting Dux4. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Statland will walk us through the preliminary um, data assessment from the Fortitude study. And then Rocio Martin, who is our global program head for FSHD, she'll talk about the work we can do in transforming the future of FSHD together. And then from there, we'll go into a Q&A session with members of the Avidity team and Dr. Statland. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Amy. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And thanks, everybody, for spending some of your Thursday with us to hear about this. Um, we're super excited to be able to share, and especially to share on World FSHD Day. I think it makes it all the more meaningful. So I'm going to talk about um, what Del Brax is designed to do, how it was designed to work, and then we're going to go through some of that um, early data on really kind of the molecular biology of, of how it's working. So if you start you know, we're calling it Delbrax, but remember Sarah mentioned the old name was AOC with antibody and O, sorry, antibody for the A and oligo for the O. And so the O there, the oligo, is the part of Delbrax that really um, is supposed to do the work. And the work that we want that oligo to do is to bind with Dex4 RNA and lead to its degradation so we don't have the negative impacts that come from um, Dex4 protein being expressed. But let's back up and, and walk through this step by step. So the way that we give Delbrax is through an intravenous infusion. So it's you know circulating in your blood, um, goes and through the body portion will bind to transferrin one receptor. So this is an antibody that cells in your body. It's expressly high cells. What that allows to do is allows this whole complex to bind and then into the muscle cells. So that's the so in terms of the Fortitude study, and um, I'm going to take you through both the overview and then the goals of the study. It's what's called a phase one, two study. Amy, I see we have you back. I'm I've back. Moved, I've moved to the study overview and study goal slides. If you want to take it from here and if you break up again, then, I, then um, I'll just keep on going. Yeah, sorry about that. I usually... Um, Somebody said, please go back. I And I apologize, but I did want to explain really how the drug works. So I don't know if we got through that whole thing. Um, yeah, because I just wanted to make the point about the siRNA. What it does is it specifically binds to the Dux4 mRNA, and then that leads to the Dux4 mRNA to be degraded. So that's really the key aspect of this drug, because then if you don't have Dux4 um, RNA that can make Dux4 protein, we should then see the effects downstream. And the key thing of this study that we really need to know, this the Fortitude trial is the first time that this drug went into humans. 
it's really important. We know that this is how the whole system is designed to work, but what we're able to do is actually test, can we get drug into muscle? Does that drug, once it gets into muscle, actually knock down the duct spore mRNA? And then once we do that, what are the downstream effects of that? So really this study allows us to answer all of these questions as we, as we go forward. And again, I apologize for my internet. Okay, so back to fortitude. If you can advance. Um, <laughs> so as I, so I think Sarah said, this is really our phase one, two study of Delbrac. So this is, as I mentioned, the first in human study. And as it's a first in human study, you really wanna focus on the safety and tolerability first of all. You wanna also understand, is the drug getting where you need it to go? Is it doing those initial steps and in how it was designed to work? And then over time, you accumulate more evidence to really try and understand what are the functional implications of the, the drug doing what it does. So to describe the study a little bit, um, we have two parts of the trial, which we call part A and part B. And in part A, what we do is we start at a pretty low dose of the drug. We move there for the first time the patients get the drug, they get an infusion of one milligram per kilogram. In that second, they get a higher dose. So once we kind of have some initial safety information, we will feel comfortable moving into the higher dose group. And then patients who come in in part B, they started an even higher dose group. Here it's the four milligram per kilogram. Um, so patients would either get one of these dose regimens or they would receive placebo so that we have some group to be able to control the effects of Delbrax too. Um, so this is a, a year long study. So we're following patients for um, up to a year. Um, during that study, they have many um, activities that they do. So many measurements, a lot of blood we're collecting. Um, importantly, we're also doing muscle biopsies. We're doing those before the start of the study and after four months of the study, and that will allow us to look at the levels of duct spore gene expression. Um, and then at the end of the one year, where we would move everybody into what we call an OLE study or an open label extension. And so then everybody who's been in the trial, whether they were on placebo in the beginning or on active drug, would move on, and so then everybody would be able to receive Delbrax in the second portion of the study, or in the, the second study, the OLE. So the data we're gonna be talking about today is just the data from the patients in part A, um, so at the lower dose, and we're focusing on the data through four months of treatment. Okay, next slide. Um, and so in that cohort A, we have 12 individuals, so four who received placebo, and eight who received Delbrax at that one to two milligram dose group. Um, you can see we have a slightly higher proportion of males. Um, in general, the treatment groups are really well balanced. That's the important thing here as we're looking at it. Um, we do allow both FSHD1 and 2 patients to enroll in the trial, but as you can see, just everybody who's come in so far happens to have um, FSHD1. And I would say that we have a pretty moderate to severe type population in terms of their clinical score with the average clinical score of just over nine. This is on a scale of zero to 15. Um, on average, five to six-ish um, D4, Z4 repeats. And if you look at the age of symptom onset, right, so 25 to 28 in the two groups, and compare that to the age at which people are when they're coming into the study, you can see that people have had FSHD symptoms at least for, you know, 20-ish plus years by the time that they're entering the study. And then in terms of the, the muscle strength or the impairment, um, if you focus on the bottom where we're, we did the quantitative muscle testing, you can see that compared to a population of individuals who don't have FSHD, the strength is um, approximately 30-ish percent of what you would predict that group to have. So um, quite a bit of impairment in the population who is in cohort A. And next slide. And so here, again, being a first in human study, we're really focused on safety and tolerability as the primary outcome. And we're really happy to have this data. And we actually are showing data from cohort A as well as the cohort B data that we have um, as of the time we took this, this safety cut. Um, and, and what you can see across all of these individuals is some really nice things. So first of all, all 39 patients who we've enrolled have remained in the study. And we haven't seen any serious adverse events and no severe adverse events. So what that means that, you know, we do see people reporting adverse events, but they've all been either mild or moderate. 
Um, and the most common things that we've seen um, repeated that have been deemed to be related to study drug are fatigue, rash, um, a decrease in hemoglobin or anemia, or chills um, that tend to happen after the infusions. But I think, again, to emphasize the key thing, nothing has been um, severe, everything has been mild or moderate, and nothing has led people discontinue treatment or things like that. So we're really happy to see this overall safety and tolerability profile in these 39 patients. Okay, next slide. So if you think back to that cartoon we showed earlier, you know, the first thing that we want to really test is, are we able to get the drug into muscle? That's how Delbrax was designed to work, but it's always good to have the data to support, you know, your hypothesis. And so what this shows is the actual amount of siRNA, which is the oligo part or that little curlicue, how much of that is actually getting into muscle. Um, the average for the group was around four nanomole or with a range of about one to 10. So it's um, when you look at across all of the, the patients in that cohort A group who got drug. What's really nice about this is that based on experiments we've done either in animal models or with a compound we have for another treatment that's a very um, closely related compound, we believe that these concentrations mean that there's enough drug in the muscle to do what we need it to do and knock down DUX4. So we're really happy to show that that whole system of getting drug into the muscle seems to be working. Um, next, study. next slide. So the next thing we want to do, again, if you think back to that cartoon, is measure, well, what are we actually doing to DUX4, right? The whole thing, reason you want to get the drug into the muscle is to knock down DUX4. Um, and I'm sure many of you have heard this at, in multiple presentations or discussions over time, but DUX4 itself is the bad guy for FSHD. It should not be expressed in, in skeletal muscle at all. Um, but it's also really hard to measure. So even though it is the causative agent of FSHD, it is expressed at very low levels and it's expressed very sporadically. So it sort of just pops up in random places at, at random times. So the way the field has um, decided to look at this is instead of measuring DUX4 itself, which really doesn't work with most of those, the techniques we have, what we do is we measure the things that happen downstream of DUX4. So DUX4 itself is a transcription factor. So it turns on a number of genes directly so the way that we measure DUX4 activity is to measure how much of those genes that are downstream of DUX4 are expressed. And so if you look in the literature or you can do experiments um, in muscles of animals, of, of transcription, of um, transgenic models, or look in um, cells derived from patients with FD, you can see a number of genes that are directly regulated by DUX4. Um, we've done a lot of experiments to find what we call our um, gene panel where we've selected four genes that are robustly turned on by DUX4 and really seem to be reproducible in our hands. And so it's the measurement of these four genes that we've used as our gene panel to really get a measure of, of DUX4 expression and that we're going to use to look at in our muscle biopsies to see, are we actually knocking down DUX4? So if you go to the next slide, we were really happy when we um, got our data back and we were able to look at this. And what we were able to show was that we were able to knock down those DEX4 regulated genes by more than 50% on average in the group that received Delbrax compared to the placebo change where there was really no group, uh, no difference for that group. Um, and again, so now thinking back to that cartoon, we've got the drug into muscle. We seem to be knocking down these genes. So this is fantastic. But you could say, well, you just measured four genes. How do we know that that's the right genes? Are you measuring the right stuff? Oh, I'm seeing the reactions on the, on the Zoom. Thanks, guys. Um, because we only measured four genes here, right? Are these the right genes? Are we doing more? And so we know from the literature and from previous studies that have been conducted, other researchers have used different genes or identified different gene panels. So we didn't stop here with just measuring our four genes. We've actually looked at two other groups of genes. Go to the next slide. Um, so we've used two other um, gene panels here, one we call the Redux4 panel. That's actually a panel of six genes that were used um, in a previous study, um, not conducted by us. And then we've also looked at a panel of 41 genes that were collected from the literature. And you can see that across all of these gene panels, we're seeing a remarkably reproduct a remarkably consistent um, amount of reduction, so just a 50 to 60 percent. And the other nice thing is that we're using a different technology when we're measuring 
um, the genes in the avidity panel versus the other two panels. So kind of our takeaway is it's not the, we aren't seeing just these good results because of the type of assay we're performing or the specific genes we're measuring. We seem to see something really reproductive, reproducible, um, whatever we measure, however we measure it. So this really confirms that we're on the right track. And, you know, these are from muscle biopsies, which are a huge ask for patients. It's a lot of work for sites to generate these, but just shows, I think, getting this data and really confirming that the drug is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, we're just so appreciative that we have patients and volunteers into our trials who are willing to give these samples because this has just been so valuable for us and I think so valuable for the field. So a special thanks to the patients who um, have given up some muscle for us to be able to perform these assays. Uh, next slide. Um, we also know that we would love to not have to take muscle biopsies from people, right? And we only typically can take muscle biopsies twice. And if you think about a long-term study and we have a um, want to be able to look at things over time, over time between doses, are we getting a continued knockdown? It's really hard if you're reliant on muscle biopsies to be able to get that kind of information. So one of the goals, sort of holy grails for the field would be to be able to use a circulating biomarker, right? So something in the blood that circulates that reflects DUX4 expression that you could just take a blood sample and get a measure, it's far less invasive. And you're able to do this almost continuously, right, with repeated sampling. We go to the next slide. So we've done a lot of work to try, um, along with a lot of other people in the field, but to really identify something um, so over the last couple of years, we've been working, looking at plasma from people with FSHD and healthy volunteers, talking to a lot of um, advisors and experts in the disease, looking at the literature, going back to our biopsies, and really trying to find something that we could measure in, in plasma that would give us an indication of, of DUX4 expression. And so we have some preliminary data that looks like we may have something that we'll be able to use in this manner. Um, and what we know is that this target is significantly elevated in patients with FSHD compared to people who are healthy individuals. Um, and so this allows us, as we mentioned, to do more frequent measuring and looking over time. So, okay, so we found this bio, potential biomarker. We're super excited. Of course, the question is, what do we see in fortitude when we look at this biomarker? So if you go to the next slide. And what you can see is that we were able to demonstrate a reduction in this biomarker over time. So really consistent with what we saw in the muscle biopsies. Again, when we give Delbrax, um, and you can look over time, you see a reduction in the circulating biomarker, whereas when you look in the individuals who got placebo, it really just hovers around zero. And it's interesting to look at this and think about it because we don't see much of a decrease after we gave that first dose, which was at one milligram per kilogram. When we went to that higher dose, it looks like that's when we start to see the decrease. So you can see how, you know, there's a lot more work we need to do here, but you can see how you could use something like this to help guide to what the right dose would be. So we, again, this is a super promising finding that we're excited to get more data on and um, continue to learn more from. Um, and if you go to the next slide, so we had on the left with the orange banner there, that was our novel DUX4 regulated biomarker. Something else we saw in the data was just looking at creatine kinase, which is a, a typical lab measure that is really just a measure of muscle damage. We actually see a reduction in that as well. And it's about a 30% reduction um, over that period that's you know, coming around at the three to four month time point. And so looking at these two together, we think that it's an early sign that not only are we knocking down DUX4, we might actually be improving muscle health as reflected by that CK. So again, a, a super exciting early indication. And if you, again, think back to that cartoon, we're getting in the drug into the muscle, we're knocking down DUX4, we're seeing some early signals that maybe we're improving muscle health. And then I think the next question is, okay, well, what does that mean for the patients and what they're able to do? And so I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Statland who is now going to take us through the next part of the story. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I wanna thank Avidity for the opportunity to share the interim clinical data from the Fortitude clinical trial. And I do wanna take a brief moment to reflect because I think this study really represents a milestone for FSHD research in general. When I entered 
the field in 2010, we had just published the Unified Genetic Model for FSHD, which for the first time identified a molecular target for therapy, the transcription factor DUX4 we've been hearing about. And now I'm really excited today to share this interim fortitude data because it's our first inhuman molecularly designed gene targeted therapy in a clinical trial, a silencing RNA that targets the DUX4 mRNA or the cause of the disease. All right, next slide. When we're reporting on clinical trial data, I do think it's really important to put the results in the context of the experience of living with FSHD. And in FSHD, we've had several large surveys in both the United States and Europe that have really looked at the most prevalent and impactful symptom categories um, which people report um, in their daily lives and I'm showing you data on the right from the most recent survey that happened in the European Union. They had over 1,100 responses. And if you look at those bars, the red to the yellow color are the high prevalence an uh, answers. And in that box are the top four symptom categories that are most prevalent and impactful for those individuals. And if you look at them, they're all related to muscle weakness, generalized weakness, problems with the shoulders and arms, difficulty with mobility or gait, or sort of the downstream effects of weakness, things like fatigue or lacking energy or endurance. And when people were then asked to sort of look towards the future and, and how this made them feel, there was a lot of concern about losing the ability to move or walk and thus losing your independence or not having the energy to work or live as someone wants to. So if we think about therapies in FSHD, if they improve muscle strength or function, they're likely going to be important and have an impact on people's lives. Can we go to the next slide? So what I wanna start with with the Fortitude data is looking at their data about strength. The way they measured strength in this study is they used something called health handheld dynamometry. In this, a evaluator uses a handheld force device, a force gauge. They have people move in very stereotypical ways to isolate muscle groups. The muscle groups that they included in this study are important muscles in FSHD. So two movements around the shoulder, the elbow flexion and extension, and the knee flexion and extension, and then the ankle dorsiflexion. That's the movement that if you lose it, it can lead to a foot drop. All of the graphs I'm going to show from here on out are oriented in the same way. They're showing the change from baseline to four months. That dotted line around the zero represents no change. If they're moving to the left, it would represent a decline or worsening strength in this click case. If it's moving to the right, that would be improving or an increase in strength. The Delbrac's treated individuals are those orange bars, the placebo, are the gray bars. And I think you can see if we average across all these muscles that are important in the disease, you can see a separation occurring between the treated and placebo patients that's really favoring treatment where the people who are treated are even gaining a little strength at four months, whereas the placebo patients are starting to lose some strength if you look at the individual muscles then in different areas, the shoulder abductor, we see a trend in the same direction, favoring treatment with Delbrax. And in the ankle dorsiflexions, we see an even larger effect. And if you take this all together and look at that difference of about three on that scale, if you remember when Amy was showing you that baseline data and she said, people were about 30% in the low 30s of normal strength. This is a 10% difference, which is a fairly large difference to be seeing at four months. Can we go to the next slide? 
Then when we take strength and we put it together and think about how we measure function, the way we're measuring function around the shoulders is something called the reachable workspace. This is a novel repurposing of an existing technology. If any of you remember those Xbox game consoles that had those 3D cameras so you could interact with the game, a really uh, creative group from the West Coast took that camera and created a device where they put people into standardized positions. And if we could roll the video, you can see that um, the person who's participating will see the movement to do on the screen. They'll then mimic that movement, and you can see the computer reconstructing that on the bottom right of the screen. When you take this together, this gives you a volume of space, your reachable workspace, and it's the surface area of that volume that the device actually reports out. If we think about the reachable workspace and the kind of tasks this represent, this is things like reaching up to put something on the shelf, washing your hair, taking a shirt on and off, or using silverware to take something to your mouth. Can we go to the next slide? And so when we look at the data in the reachable workspace um, from the Fortitude trial, on the top, we see the average of the le left and right side. And on the bottom, we're really looking at the dominant arm, assuming that this is going to be the arm most people are using for tasks. And you can see all the way down, there's this improvement in the Delbrax treated participants and some degree of a loss of that reachable workspace according, uh, occurring in our placebo-treated individuals. That Q1 plus 3 row, that's the reaching above the head. The Q1 to 4 or 1 to 5 is the whole reachable workspace. The 5 just means being able to reach backwards. And again, the separation we're seeing here would be fairly large at four months, but we'll need to see what happens over time to really understand this better. Can we go to the next slide? But one way to put this into context is to look and say, well, what do we see happening in a natural history study? Some of you may know that I run a clinical research network for FSHD. We have sites around the world and we've been doing a study that we call Resolve for really the last five years. Some of you on this webinar may have participated in it, so your data may be included here. And the purpose of that study was really to validate outcome measures for use in clinical trials. One of the outcome measures that we were testing was the reachable workspace. And we had 237 people who enrolled in this study. We had visits that occurred over two days for the first visit. And the reason we did that was to make sure that the estimate of that reachable workspace was indeed reliable, and it was highly reliable. And then we had visits at months 3, 12, 18, and 24. Can we go to the next slide? So one thing we could do is we could compare the Delrax treated people in orange that you see here to a group of 63 individuals who are matched to those, those fortitude clinical trial participants by age, by their functional status and their reachable workspace at baseline. And you can see in the natural history, we really see either no change or just a slight decrease occurring at three months. And this is compared to that slight improvement we're now seeing um, in the Delbrax treated participants in the Fortitude trial. And so we can say for reachable workspace, we're seeing improvements versus the natural history. But one question that will always come up is, well, is there something, and some of you may have heard about this, a placebo effect or the effect of being in a clinical trial at play here, but that's why we have the placebo patients. And so in this case, we can see this separation occurring both to the placebo participants as well as to a much larger natural history cohort. Can we go to the next slide? 
We then want to look at the patient reported impact of being in this study. And we do this by looking at something called the global impression of C for change or S for severity. This is, for example, asking someone compared to the last time you came in, are you experiencing no change? Are you a little better, a lot better, or a little worse, or a lot worse? And you can see for the patients, their trends towards improvement in both their impression of change that's occurred since they entered the study and the severity of the disease that are favoring treatment. The EQ5 is just a more general way of asking about overall quality of life, which also appears to be improved for the Delbrax treated participants at four months. On the right side, we have the clinician version of this, where we ask the clinicians, people like me at the site, you know, do you think someone's improved versus their first visit? And you can see there's a slightly wider separation occurring here, favoring those Delbrax treated participants. And it's important to remember that the participants in the study, the clinicians like me who are working at the sites and the evaluators measuring things, we're all blinded to what people are getting. Can we go to the next slide? So in summary, when we look at the Fortitude trial, as Amy mentioned, the first thing that's important, it does seem safe and tolerable to give the drug, which is very encouraging. We're seeing evidence the drug's getting into the muscle. It's having that effect on Dux4 and then having that effect on circulating biomarkers to reflect either Dux4 or overall muscle damage. And then this is supported by these trends and improvement in strength, function, and patient-reported impact of the disease. And I think one question the field's always asked, if we had a true gene-targeted therapy, you know, what would we see? Would we really just see a halt or a reduction in the natural history of what happens to people over time, or if we could really treat the disease with those muscles that people have less, would we start to see people improving? And I'm very hopeful that what we're seeing here are signs that may support this idea that a really effective treatment, we might not just get a halt or progression, but start to see people improve a little beyond that. But this is what we'll see as we see the rest of the data come out from this clinical trial, which I'm very excited to do. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Avidity now to, to finish out. Thank you, Dr. Statland. Um, I'm very grateful to be here today with the FSHD community on the FSHD day and, and also sharing this, this amazing information. So if we go to, to the next slide, we are really excited to continue to move forward Del Brax uh, as the first investigational therapy that targets the root cause of FSHD. And we are, as Amy said, and as Dr. Stadman said, we're connecting all the dots. We're getting it into the muscle. This is translating into a deep reduction of greater than 50% in DAX4 regulated genes across multiple panels. There's also the re reduction in the DAX4 regu regulated circulating biomarker and creatine kinase. We are also seeing the er signs of improvement at this early time point of only four months. And all of these in the context of favorable safety and durability profile with no serious adverse events, no severe adverse events, and not tr no treatment discontinuations. So we are really committed to accelerate the BRACs towards an approval as we believe this is the best way to provide broad access of the of their BRACs to the community. So if we go to the next slide, we can walk through what that looks like. Instead of conducting a standalone phase three study, the ability team uh, decided to be more, more fast and more nimble and amend the current 42 study to add two cohorts, cohort C and D, with the potential to get approval. So we have two shots on goal. Let me just take a step back and, and go through the study design as we have it. So we have cohort A and cohort B that were the dose escalation cohorts. Cohort A is basically the data that you just saw today at four months. 
Um, and then cohort B is a, a higher dose of four milligram per kilogram. And we are still waiting for that data to further mature before we can share it with, with all of you. Uh, so both cohort A and cohort B have a follow-up of up to 12 months. So as, as we get as we get more data, we will be we will be sharing it. So what we are adding now is cohort C, which is a, what we call the biomarker cohort, and this is what could give us potentially an accelerated approval in the US. This is a path that is available with the FDA, and we're planning to start this study in the second half of 2024. Biomarker basically is, is what Amy has been sharing, right? So this is essentially taking the DAX4 regulated gene panel and using that to measure the effect of the drug and then going to the regulatory authorities with, uh, with that package. So it's basically based on um, the, the, gene, the gene panel or, and or the circulating biomarker. And for that, we're going to need to conduct muscle biopsies, both as at baseline and also at four months. Uh, this cohort is going to have around 40 patients. Then the cohort D will be a much larger cohort. And this is what we're calling the functional cohort. So in this case, the endpoint is going to be a functional endpoint. And we're starting that study in the first half of 2025. And it will not be requiring uh, muscle biopsies. So all of these studies are placebo controlled and um, they're followed for a 12 month follow up. And, as, and after 12 month follow up, we have the open label extension, which is when, as Amy described, that's the opportunity for uh, the placebo patients to roll over into active, active therapy. So with this, we're, we're very excited to really move as fast as possible to bring this therapy to patients. If we can go to the next slide, I just want to echo how committed we are, and we're you know we're so excited to be celebrating World FSHD Day with you today. And um, I wanted to just show you another picture of our team. Uh, this is a group of people who are re working relentlessly to to bring the Brax as fast as possible to you. Um, and we are uh, you know we share we share that commitment and we share that hope with all of you. Um, if we go to the next slide, I would just wanted to highlight how important staying connected with the FSHD society is. There's a, a ton of good work and, and, and efforts that are ongoing to support you through your journey. Um, there's also opportunity to participate in natural history studies. Uh, and generate more, you know, help the community generate more data. And there's also an opportunity to just build, just build community within, within um, FSHD. Um, so with that, I also want to share that, um, you know, just we have this uh, phase one, two study, uh, 42 that is completed enrollment. And now we're just waiting for more follow-up and we'll be sharing more data with you as it matures. We're going to be initiating the registration cohorts, cohort C in the second half of this year and cohort D in the first half of next year. And we are partnering very closely with FSHD Society. They are aware of every single step that we take. So if you want to stay informed about updates on our end, please stay connected with FSHD Society because they know everything that we do. Um, we also wanted to share that we participated in the FSHD Connect conference uh, last week, um, and many of you might have been there. And there were already a lot of questions, as you can imagine, about our program and our future. So we wanted to tackle up front some of the most frequent questions that we received, and, and then we can open it up for more questions. So the, the first one is around expanded access program. So for those that might not be aware about um, expanded access, this is basically a mechanism to obtain access to an investigational therapy that has not been approved yet by the regulators. And it, regulators do a really good job in evaluating the benefit risk profile of therapies before they approve them, right? So they need to have uh, a robust data set in order to do so. So expanded access is essentially providing access to the drug before the regulators have done that thorough review and outside of a clinical trial. 
Um, so at this point, we are fully committed to enroll cohort C and cohort D as fast as possible and get the BRACs through the finish line, through an approval as fast as possible. We believe that that's the best mechanism to provide broad access to the FSHD community. In addition to that, we, we currently have um, patients uh, that are in placebo and we will have patients in placebo, both in cohort C and cohort D. So opening up um, an expanded access program while you have patients on placebo can be, um, has, has some ethical questions. Um, the other question that we received was around um, when are we going to evaluate the BRACs in, in the pediatric population? And I'd like to um, open up this question for Amy to, to respond. Yeah, thanks, Rocio. Yeah, we recognize that for pediatric patients living with FSHD, this is also super critical and wanting to get access to treatments as soon as possible um, is you know, really front of mind for that population. So where we are right now, um, there are some regulatory requirements in terms of the amount of adult data you have before you can move into trials in the pediatric population. So we're really focusing right now on getting that um, adult data to the point that can allow us to continue to move forward in the, the pediatric space. Um, and um, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> excuse me. So yeah, so we're working on that. And at the same time, we are working through plans of how we can try and get this drug approved for pediatric patients as quickly as possible. There are still some open questions about who exactly the right um, patients would be from the pediatric side to come into trials, what the endpoints would be, how long you'd need to follow them. So we're working through a lot of those things and we hope to be able to you know, share more in the upcoming year or so and have our plan more fleshed out. But you know, we, we know that this is a super important population that we wanna continue, um, that we wanna begin studying as, as soon as we can. Uh, back to you, Rocio, for the next one. Yes, and then the other question was around eligibility for, for clinical trials. And we, we realized that a, the clinical trials need to have inclusion and exclusion criteria that enable to identify improvement within a certain period of time. So that's how we are defining our inclusion inclusion criteria. That does not mean that once the drug is approved, it's just going to be restricted to the population that was kind of like reflected in the study. Uh, we're, we're working towards ha having the broadest possible uh, label and access to, to a broader population than what is reflected right now on our on our clinical trials. Um, Amy, anything that you would like to add on that? Nope, good answer. So I think with that, we can open it up for more questions, June. Okay, yes, thank you. Well, there are quite a few, and I, I know we won't get through all of them, but we'll try our best. So, um, there are some questions, I guess, to go over some of the details of the, um, I guess, the upcoming cohort uh, C and D. They're wondering how many visits would be made, required in the first year, and for the open label extension part. Um, I can take that, Rocio. Um, you know, it's still a little bit of work in progress as we're working through some of the, the final details there. We don't have the, the full protocol done, but it's looking like roughly 12-ish visits in that first year um, for Part C, and we're hoping to reduce that a little bit moving forward into Part D. And then as you move into um, extension studies, you generally have less frequent visits, and so we're um, it would probably be even less than 12 over the course of a year as we move forward. Um, but we, you know, we do recognize these are still pretty um, high burden type studies to be in. We do ask a lot of our patients. And so, um, yeah, but it, okay. that's kind of roughly the number where we are now. Thank you. Um, there's a question I'm not mentioning post-infusion anemia. I don't, was that reported as a one of the um, adverse events, or is that group? Um, yeah, I can I can take that too. Okay. No, I don't see anyone else jumping. Okay, they're wondering how um, quickly it resolved, or you know what it. Yeah. What that so was what about. we tend to see are transient decreases in hemoglobin um, that tend to resolve before we give that next infusion. So we and um, I I don't think I mentioned the infusion schedule when I described the study, where. 
um, we're giving drug every six weeks at the beginning of the trial for the first three doses. And after that, the duration between the infusions would be quarterly or every 13 weeks. Um, but even with the six week infusion, and in particular with this, um, we're seeing that people will see a small decrease in hemoglobin that tends to come back before they get their next infusion. We have a number of people asking about how um, long lasting is the effect of an injection and probably is probably partly dose dependent, but does it basically, does it linger and stay in the muscle and stay active um, for many months or weeks? Do you have a sense of the time scale? Yes. I feel like I just keep talking. Someone interrupt me if you'd like. Um, we know from animal models where we can do more repeated measurements um, well, the, the knockdown is sustained over um, at least a three-month time period. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the challenges with muscle biopsies to try and answer the same question, right? Because we're only getting that muscle biopsy in one point of time. So this is where some of the information with the circulating biomarker will give us more information from the human studies across the, the different doses about how long the duration of knockdown is. Um, I did see another question in the chat about the, the SIR in itself, SIRNA in muscle. Mm -hmm. And um, we do know that once it's in the muscle, it is pretty stable and it can work multiple times. So it once it's in the muscle, it's just kind of hanging out there waiting for duct for RNA to pop up and then it can lead to its destruction. But it's still staying in the muscle after that and kind of looking for the next um, duct for RNA that might get made. Okay. There was a lot of curiosity about the four milligram um, per kilogram dosage. Um, since you presented only from the two milligram group, do you um, have a timeline where you'll have data from that that you'll be able to share? Um, Marcia, are you going to take that? <laughs> Right now, we're not sharing timeline around when we will have that data available. I will, you know, as I said, we will keep um, the community updated as, as data matures and we're able to, to analyze uh, additional data. Sarah, anything that you would like to add? Yeah, I, I would just add that we have said that we expect to make the selection of both the dose and also the dose interval for the phase three portion of the study. So that is cohort C and cohort D. The, we expect to make that decision in Q3. And then probably at around the time of initiation of cohort C, um, we would make an announcement as to the dose, the dose, uh, the dose and the dose selection. Okay. Um, let's see. I think um, a lot of people want to know how how would they join or how would they, you know, get involved with the next uh, the cohort C and D. Um, what can they do to, I guess, be ready <laughs> or you know? And I would add on to that um, yeah. where where you're looking at sites. There's a lot of questions about where those sites will be, what countries you might be going into. Amy, you want me to go? I'm um, sure. So right now we have 17 sites in US, Canada, and the UK. Um, and cohort C is going to be focused on those sites that we already have open. When we expand to cohort D, we will open up more sites and also we will be in more countries. And we will keep FSHD Society updated on all our steps as well as you may be able to find the information in clinicaltrials.gov uh, as it becomes available. Uh, the best way is to partner with your physician and partner with FSHD Society and, and keep, that connect, keep that connection and they will, they will appraise of the next steps. And there's been a question about um, whether somebody would need to have had a genetic um, confirmation. So if they haven't been genetically tested yet, um, is now the yeah. time to do that so that they know by the time you're recruiting whether they have a confirmed status? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so we do not require previous genetic testing to get into Fortitude. We are doing it as part of the screening process. Um, but if you do have genetic testing, it is a slightly more streamlined process of getting into the trial. 
So I would say don't let that stop you if you haven't been genetic tested, if you're really interested in participating, but if you have it, it can, it can help, but you don't need to go do it ahead of time now. We'll do it as part of the trial. I would also, if I may add, as the therapy, once the therapy becomes approved, if payers will most likely require a genetic test uh, for reimbursement. So I would encourage everybody to be part of a genetic testing program that FSHD Society is putting in place. Great. Um, I don't know if this uh, cohort that you reported on is large enough to answer this question, but uh, people wanted to know if you see any kind of correlation between the decline in ducts for regulated genes and functional outcomes. I think it's too early to say, but we're, we're, we're also very interested in that question. So we can get a sense of like how much ducts for knockdown do you need? Um, and also like the correlations between the functional changes, the circulating biomarker, all of those things where as we get more data and more people and longer term data, yeah, we're really going to be doing a lot of, to look at that and really understand it. Uh, there's a question regarding this novel biomarker. Um, I, we presume it's related to ducts for um, regulated genes, but they were wondering, have you, has anyone actually looked at those biomarkers in uh, healthy, you know, controls versus, you know, the placebo with FSHD? Yeah, so what we know is that um, if you take a blood sample from health, a group of healthy individuals and a group of individuals living with FSHD, you see um, quite a bit higher expression in people who have FSHD already. And so then when we treat, we're lowering it more toward what you would see in, in a healthy population. So it is something elevated in FSHD population. That was a key part of our um, initial work on the target. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Waiting through these questions, waiting. Um, While June is looking, yeah. I'll just comment. You guys are asking wonderful questions and there are a lot coming in. So we're doing our best to filter through and address as many as possible. Um, I think this might be an opportunity to clarify um, this accelerated approval, they may not be familiar with this uh, in the audience, but the question is, if you're seeing these measurable improvements, is there a thought to being able to give Delbrax um, more quickly to patients, so basically ending the placebo-controlled portion and giving the drug, drug to all participants? Amy, you want me to take a step at that one? Sure. So we we need to we need to have the twelve month follow up of all the patients, um, and and then there's the opportunity for the placebo patients to roll over and receive active drug as 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 part of the open label extension. Yeah, I would That's just add, given the the variability. Yeah. Um, we still need to do, we do still need to have that placebo control to demonstrate changes from placebo. Um, it's really hard in this disease, I think, to just have treated and compare it to historic data or things given how variable this disease can be. So that's why we do need to keep having a, a placebo control through our now phase one, two, three trial as we've, we've laid out. And, I, and one other question I did see, I, we are considering part C phase three, as well as part D. I just saw that question pop up in the chat at one point. So thought it'd take 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, let's see. If someone was asking, how long have the mild to moderate side effects lasted? Are we talking hours, days, or weeks and months? <sighs> There's, there's a range, right? So um, in general, I think everything we're seeing is transient. We do have some individuals who are um, saying that they have fatigue for much longer periods. Um, but we also know that some of those people are on placebo. And, you know, it is really hard with something that is so common in FSHD to really separate a true side effect versus kind of a part of the disease. Um, so, but I would say the things that relate to, um, 
it, there's a range. I don't think there's a, a great answer, a simple answer we can give at this point. Um, let's see, will the 2025 cohort, I think they're referring to the cohort D, will you have the same um, eligibility criteria in terms of age and things like that? Yeah, in, in general, it'll be pretty close. We're still working through the details. I think in, it'll look pretty similar to what we've studied so far. Maybe some slight modifications that we aren't 100% sure on yet. So okay. more, more, we'll stay tuned on that one. Okay. Um, someone's asking for clarification. What do you mean by a functional cohort for phase D? So functional cohort is, is, is basically based on an, an endpoint that is clinically measurable um, versus the biomarker cohort, which is going to be the, the uh, DAX4 regulated genes. And the functional, as you know, as I, I think I mentioned, this is uh, the purpose of that is full approval and also uh, approval XUS. Uh, question, did you see how specific to muscle is the uptake of the drug? I mean, it's designed to be, but is it in fact highly muscle specific? Um, I can answer that. We we know from animal studies that the drug does go to a lot of places in the body. Um, you do have a really high expression, though, of that transferrin 1 receptor in muscle. So the important thing is that we're getting the drug you know, into the muscle tissue, and we, we clearly see that. Um, the question is, well, what if it gets taken up into other tissues, what would happen to it? Uh, most of those other tissues don't have ducts for, so it wouldn't really do anything because there's nothing for it to bind to is kind of how we think about it um, in general. So yeah, it does go to more places in the body besides muscle, but the key thing is that we're also getting it into muscle and we're getting quite a bit of it in muscle. Mm -hmm. Um, there were a few questions around the biomarker. Um, you know, is it proprietary? Can you share any more details about what that is? And is this the way forward for clinical trials? How are you thinking about this biomarker's utility moving forward? Yeah, well, it, it's at this point, you know, um, as we described, it is something novel. And so there are steps that we need to go through as a company, given that this is a novel invention, um, some steps that we need to take before we're able to share it, what the specific target is more broadly. But at some point, we would want to share it because we think that, yeah, the whole concept of circulating biomarkers is really going to be helpful for the entire community. And that's not something that, you know, we just want to own. And there are a lot of investigators um, working across different countries and places and companies and academic institutions who are working on additional biomarkers as well. So I think it'll be really interesting as we, the field gets more data and we're able to look at different types of biomarkers, different types of samples as well, and kind of collaborate across some of those could be some interesting thing. But yeah, I think for the future of the field, this, this would be immensely and incredibly helpful to move us all forward more rapidly. Okay. We are about out of time, but there's, I see several questions relating to expanded access. So um, can someone elaborate on what that is and at what point in the development is that something that the company can consider? I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll address that question. So at this point, again, expanded access is a mechanism to obtain access to the drug prior to the regulatory approval, right? And our priority right now is to get cohort C and cohort D enrolled, have the studies read out and focus on getting, getting the drug approved, as that is the way to ensure broad access to patients as fast as possible. Right. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, we so appreciate your taking the time to share these results with us today. And um, yes, I see all the love, the hearts and applause going up. And um, yes, the, the video will be available later. And uh, I just wanted to say, uh, join us 
next month for FSH University. That's on, on July 18th, 1 p.m. Eastern time. And um, I think our own Amanda Hill will introduce Better Life FSHD, which is an innovative health platform dedicating to helping you take control of your health and your symptoms and to help advance FSHD research while, while you're doing that. So join us next month. And until then, uh, happy World FSHD Day. This is such a, a milestone, really, for our community. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.